Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast with me, the glorious, handsome, beautiful, mm -hmm. and you said that yourself, Tim, so don't laugh, Dotton Adebayo. Yeah, but I said it before the record button was, was, that was pushed, so no one will ever be able to prove it. The reason why I, I mentioned it was because you'd said it before the record button. So I wanted to make sure that I can put this down in history. Uh, I'm a trustworthy person. Everybody knows I don't lie. The Queen gave me an MBE. What has she given you lately? Uh, well, you're not going to send me down there. I'll end up with, 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 with my head getting cut off. Let, let's steer us back to safer ground okay. uh, on, the, on the 10th of June, yeah. 1984. May I just say, your head won't be cut off until you come back to Britain. So whilst you're out there in Rio where you are, like Ronnie Biggs, you'll be doing time until you see the light. And then, of course, oh, and, and, until I decide that the national health system is worth coming, national health service is worth coming back for, oh, as, you, as Ronnie Biggs did. That, that, that might be sooner than you think with your rates of coronavirus <laughs> over that side, you know. Indeed. Okay, so 10th of June 1984. And this is on your patch, Tim. This is at the Maracanã. As people know, every issue, every edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, we take a look at an iconic game and try and discuss it and look at the context of the times and uh, have a listen to the soundtrack that accompanied uh, the iconic match as well. This time though, it's only a friendly and I'm not sure if friendlies can ever be iconic, but then again, then again, it's England versus Brazil. Then again, it's at the Maracanã in Rio de Janeiro. And then again, as uh, Jimmy Greaves would say after the match, sorry, I'm, I'm giving away the ending now, but as Jimmy Greaves would say after the match, you know, great night for England, doesn't matter if it's a friendly, doesn't matter, we'll take it, great night for England. You've, you've done a lot of the then agains, uh, and uh, this is funny to me because firstly, thinking about this game, yes, and thinking about the whole era yesterday, I just turned 19, and it's just amazing how you live everything with an intensity then. I don't know if you, if you were in Sweden at the time. At a, a, no, I was back here. I was at right. university. Um, oh, I remember it very, very well. The whole of yeah, this. Yeah, I remember the whole the whole era. Uh, when I went for my afternoon walk yesterday, everything just came flooding back. But the then agains. I've just been, been we've just been talking about off the air on, uh, about Some Like It Hot, uh, and uh, which is a great, great film. And one of my favourite parts is... The Mafia boss, Little Bonaparte, just before they give the other gangster Spats the birthday cake and the fella comes out with a submachine gun and kills him. I think he, there was something in that cake that disagreed <laughs> with him. Just before <laughs> yeah. Little Bonaparte, who's still alive, or he was last time I looked. The, the act who played Little Bonaparte, who was old in 1959, is still yes. alive. But just before he gives this speech, when he's setting up spats and he's saying some say he's getting too big for his boots but i say you can keep a good man down some say he shouldn't have let those two witnesses get away but i say to forgive to err is human to forgive is divine this match there's a lot of that some say <laughs> but i say about it it's only a friendly, and at this point, 1984, there's no conception of a permanent Brazil side. doesn't happen. That doesn't really happen until the mid-90s when Nike get involved. Uh, everything in South American football at this moment is like a tournament, and there's massive gaps between tournaments. So after the 82 World Cup, they play a Copa America in 83, which is stretched out over a few months. It's not a tournament in, in, in one host nation. It's all over. So they do that in 83. In 85, they have World Cup qualifiers. So they have a few friendlies and they, they have the World Cup qualifiers. There's nothing in between, apart from three friendlies that they fix up in June of 84. Now, they haven't got a coach because they haven't got any games. So they get uh, Zico's brother, Edu, who has a good coaching career, but they put him in charge for just these three games. 
and they don't bring any of their European-based stars home. This is a quite a new thing in Brazil. And before, before really, before the 82 World Cup, they don't pick players who play abroad. The 82 World Cup, there's a first two or three are in there. Come 86, there's more. And come 1990, the, the squad is half Europe and half uh, abroad. 1994, it's almost all abroad. That's the dynamic of it. So there's some great that Zico and Socrates and 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 uh, and Falcão and Cedeiros. There's some great players that they don't that they don't pick because they're, they're they're now playing abroad. So it, it's all a little bit off the cuff. Brazil. This is the first of three games. They've also got games against Argentina and Uruguay friendlies. So it, it's a little bit off the cuff. Some say, but I say. You have a look at that team, and there are some top players in there. On the back four, who John Barnes just waltzes through for, for the goal. The right back is Leandro, who's an absolute legend in Brazilian football. We'll talk about him maybe a little bit later on. The left back is Junior, a legend. And the, the, the two of them were, were, were the fullbacks of the previous World Cup. The centre-backs, Moser and Ricardo Gomes, are young. Five years later, when Brazil win the Copa America in 89, they are the centre-back partnership. They're the centre-back partnership in the 1990 World Cup. And they would have been in 1994, but both of them get injured on the, on the, uh, the eve of the tournament. So that's a top back four. That really is. Up front, the centre-forward, Roberto Dinamite, Bobby Dynamite, World Cup player, legend. He's probably maybe the biggest legend in the history of Vasco da Gama. The right winger who has the biggest goal, goal threat. He's the most dangerous player that Brazil have in the game. He has a terrific duel with Kenny Sanson. Uh, Renato, Renato Gaúcho or, or Renato Portalupi. Was on, he, he himself says that he was at least as good as Cristiano Ronaldo. He had a little bit of time in Roma. He didn't, th 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 that's very, very him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if he was chocolate, he'd eat himself. <laughs> and, you know, an, an, an absolute great, a, a legend in Brazilian football. Um, could well be the next coach of the Brazilian national team as well. He would have played the 86 World Cup but he, he, he jumped the hotel looking for honey, which was very, very him. And he ended up on disciplinary uh, uh, grounds, get, getting cut from the squad. Played a little bit in 1990. So there are some great players in the, in the Brazil side. So, you know, some say it's only a friendly and it's a scratch Brazil side. But I say it was a pretty good side that England beat. Some say... Uh... <laughs> Aziz missed an open goal very early on. And some say <laughs> that Brazil was taking pot shots from the left, from the right, and from the centre. Most of them again over the bar. What do you say? That Peter Shilton kept us in the game early on. He made some really vital saves early on. They were vital, but they weren't spectacular. No, they were rather rudimentary saves. I thought. Well, he, well, he was—he was a big bloke, wasn't he, Shilton? So he's—he—he he, he filled the goal and he—he he, he made the goal look look small for the player who's who's bearing down on him. But I think that just that calm at the start of the game—that's vital because you've got to remember the context here. Bobby Robson is the England coach. Took over after the eighty-two World Cup. He doesn't know the job, and he's lost for a while. And England failed to qualify for the European Championships, which are just about to take place in, in, in 84. They've just had a terrible, terrible run of results. Awful run of results. It was even suggested by the likes of Jimmy Hill, who was the, the king of TV football punditry at the time, that England shouldn't go on this tour because you, you, you just, you're just exposing yourself to be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and the the stock of the England team was so low that the first half wasn't on TV. You, the TV coverage started at half time. Uh, and I've, I vividly remember the day. I remember chatting in the pub earlier and thinking, oh God, you know, we're going to be like 10 down at half time or something like that. Instead, when you join the, 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 the commentary, it's on the stroke of half time. And they have to tell you rather sheepishly, you know that John Barnes has just scored one of the one of the great England goals. So the, the early calm, weathering the early storm, was very very important. There's a big crowd in there, uh, and you hear just before the John Barnes goal, 
they're starting to turn against the team. It's one of the, the, the playing in front of Brazil crowds, the Brazil team playing at the Maracanã, the crowd is horrible and it can work for them. But if they don't turn it on, it can start working against them. And it was already working against them at the time that John Barnes scored, scored his goal. So it was vital that England weathered that early storm and started turning the crowd against the team and, uh, and, and gave themselves a platform for a win that, in the end, it could have been even bigger than 2-0. OK, we, we can agree, whatever you say, that uh, this was a match between two unspectacular national teams, yeah? And that's although, not being disrespectful. Yeah, al al although, and it was only thinking about this yesterday, that the penny really dropped. And I think this game is the start of the England side that six years later reached the semi-finals of the World Cup and are only beaten on penalties. Why do I say that? Because a, a lot of the players from this England side didn't last. And if you go through them, Mike Duxbury at right back, he hardly played again. Dave Watson, the centre-back, uh, was in and around for a little while, but but um, didn't really figure very, very much. Mark Chamberlain on the right wing, he, he didn't didn't really play much after this tour. Made a bizarre move to Sheffield Wednesday. Tony Woodcock up front is just coming to the end. So a number of these players didn't go the journey. But Bobby Robson, the coach, as he's flying over, thinking, oh God, we're going to be humiliated. What does he do? he becomes a little bit Lord Nelson. You know what? The boldest solutions are the best. And he goes to Brazil in the Maracanã with two wingers and two strikers. Oh, it's, 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 an amazing, it's an amazingly bold decision to do that. And the only way it will work is if these two wingers work hard. They've got to, they've got to work up and back. Otherwise, we're just going to be absolutely overrun. And I think that was a template for a lot of what Robson did over, over the next few years. You know, new players emerged. He had the, the emergence of, of, of Lineker was vital over the, over the next few years. And then Gascoigne for 1990, Waddle and Beardsley and so on. But I remember before that semi-final against the Germans. Now, the England midfield in that semi-final against the Germans, it was Gascoigne, Waddle and Platt. And Platt at the time was an attacking midfielder. He, 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 he played further back later on, but he was very much an attacking midfielder. I remember thinking before that game, we're going to get overrun in midfield. And we didn't. In fact, I think we were the better side. And, and we, uh, uh, we had a lot of the midfield. But again, the bolder measure turned out to be the best because he had players there who could hurt the opposition. And as long as everyone worked back, you could defend well, in, uh, well enough. So I think the thing that he did in this game Backs to the wall against Brazil is the template for the next the next few years, very successful next few years of the England national team. Yeah, I feel sorry, really sorry, this is for Henry V. You see, people will give Nelson the credit, but actually, as Shakespeare uh, very dramatically displayed in perhaps his most famous history. Henry V, it was, that said, once more to the breach, dear friends, once more. Had the bar been alive. Up. Yeah, Had indeed. the bar been alive. He'd, he'd, he'd done a good one on, 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 on Lord Nelson, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, for definite. And he would have done a decent one on Mark Hatesley, yeah. who yeah. is... <laughs> The scorer of the second England goal. We'll go back and talk about the John Barnes one. I think there's there's much meat in that as well. But the one player, when you say that none of these players or few of these players moved on, John Barnes did, Mark Hately did as well, spectacularly. Well, Mark Hately, this game transformed him into a star because it was on the basis of what he did in this game. The fantastic header... And leading the line, he's the one who gives Barnes the ball for the for the uh, uh, the run. He, he, um, he was in the, what was then the second division with Portsmouth. On the basis of this game, he goes to AC Milan, and he's a star for the next year and a half. He is the biggest star in English football. He gets overtaken by Lineker on the on the on the road to the '86 World Cup, and he doesn't play. Uh, I think he got dropped after the first game or the first two games. And that, that was kind of the end of him at, at, at the highest level. But for a while, he was the main man. He was a tiller. 
because he he went to AC Milan and he just terror terrorized defenses with his with his with his technique and his, and his physicality. See, this is one of the things that fascinates me about this game. The contrast between the the, the two goal scorers, because Hately is the modern world. You do one thing and you're, you're you're as a kid and you're already on the way to a big club. John Barnes, who scores his unbelievable goal, was at Watford. And stayed at Watford for another three years. And can you imagine that these days? You score a goal like that, and you stay at Watford. You know, to, if it was today, Real Madrid have been, would have been knocking on his on, on his door. So we're just poised between the new world and the old world. And going back to that Barnes goal, how on earth did that Brazilian back four that you mentioned earlier allow him to uh, slide past them one way? slide past them the other way, slide past them back the other way, and then put it on his less favoured right foot to put it past the goalie. It, honestly, I have watched this for the purposes of this podcast. I've watched it 20 times. And it's like that phantom Ali punch against Sonny Liston. <laughs> you watch over, and even when Ali himself explains it, you still don't get it. And I've watched him. You know what he said, or he certainly hinted at, that the Brazilians were standing back and saying, ah, let him go off on a run. He ain't got the skills yet. Them lot, they're not like us, you know, they, these English. They're not, he's not going to get past all four of us and then slot it in with his less favoured right foot past our goalie. Are you having a laugh? Well, here I'm going to get in trouble over, over where I live because the right back, Leandro, is an absolute legend. I'm recently a magazine that canvassed lots of journalists to pick the best Brazil side of all time. And Leandro didn't get in at right back. And a lot of people were irate that he didn't get in. And you think you've got Carlos Alberto, you've got Cafu, you've got Jorginho, you've got Jama Santos, you've got some, and, and lots of people, he, he's an absolute legend for what he did with, with, with Flamengo. And I have to say, I don't really get it. And we did one about the 82 World Cup and Paolo Rossi, where I'm clearly in that World Cup, he's one of the weak links. Defensively, he's, he's, he's very creative and he's, he's like a midfielder. He wants to be a midfielder, I think. But as a right back, he just he's beaten so easily. And this one, and it, it's, it's not the only time it happens in a game. And he's, he's the marker of John Barnes. He doesn't even bother marking him. He more or less waves him through. You know, he was on dodgy knees, Leandro, and, and possibly was better as a centre-back. Um but, you know, it's, it's a dreadful marking display. He just, it, it was often, often said for John Barnes that th this goal was a problem for him because people then expected it of him all the time. And I, I, I did wonder sometimes during his career, because I used to go to Watford just to watch him. I, I thought he was, he was an amazing player. He's the only person who could get me to, to pay money at the turnstiles to watch a Graham Taylor team was, was, was John Barnes. I used to think he was, he was fantastic. I do wonder if his diet was right, because I think he, was a, he, he put on a little bit too much weight. And I think he lost some of his acceleration speed. But for me, the acceleration speed to this goal is vital, because he's, he's taken the right back. He's taken Leandro out of the game. He just drifted past him so easily. And uh, you're right, the, the defensive cover is, 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 is appalling. It does seem to me, though, that, um, you know, this, uh, the aftermath of this game, which leaves uh, John Barnes in Watford, is perhaps because it wasn't recognised. I mean, people think it's a brilliant goal, but I don't think, I wonder whether the, the gatekeepers of, you know, football history think of it as great as all that when they look at the side or look at how easy it was for him to get around the Brazilian defence. No, I just wonder I, I, whether... I go the other uh, way. I, th I think people loved it so much that they expected it every time. They expected it. I know, no, I get that, that they expected it every time, but they expected it against, you know, probably much stiffer defences every yeah. time as well, you know. I wonder, though, Tim, whether 
a, a spectacular goal is less spectacular because of the circumstances. Principally, principally circumstances like weak defense or mistake by the opposition or whatever it might be. Um, does that diminish the stature of a great goal? No, because if, if the defense looked like waxworks, it's because he's made them look like waxworks. That for me just that, that, that emphasizes the, the extraordinary quality of, of what he did. Because if it was that easy, people would be doing it all the time. I, I think you have a great point that again speaks to my, you know, my point, my reference to the uh, Ali Phantom punch against mm. L Liston. Um, people don't get it because we don't see maybe the professionals do they tend to actually because they've they've been through it at that level but we don't see the subtleties of the game particularly in dribbling dribbling is an art of deception mm. and and there is so much more to that art of deception than just going past one player doing a step over and going past another player it's the way you drop your shoulders it's the way your head is where your Perfect. eyes are well and all these other aspects that you don't sort of get when you analyze the goals over and over and over and over again those art forms are so subtle you don't get it i know mm. for example that you know both when i played football uh, somebody's gotten past me by a little drop of the shoulder or whatever it was and it made it look easy because what you're watching is his feet i know like for example on a motorcycle i've crashed come off before because going along a road on a wet day maybe a little bit too fast but nevertheless on a wet day and a car is coming um, into my path from a T-junction. And it's not actually, it's supposed to stop because it's supposed to give way. I've got the right of way, but it comes to the T-junction and then it stops. And I'm thinking, okay. And then it kind of like, just, you know, jumps up a bit, you know, like when they take the foot off the brake for a moment and the car just like, just lurches forward, maybe just only an inch or two. But I've watched that because I'm, I'm the equivalent of the professional defender now. I can see the subtle art of danger, if you like. And that's where they get fooled because they you know, make a decision one way or another and the dribbler goes the other way. But, you know, it, 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 we, we can never be expected to see that. I get it. But do you see it when you, when you like judge a goal? Do you see it? I think it's like the relativity of time. Isn't it? Because for Barnes, who's in control of the situation, everything is happening in slow motion. Oh, yeah, I just dip my shoulder here. He doesn't remember throw. it. No, obviously. It, 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 happens, on, it, it. happens on a level of instinct. Yeah, no, that's but, what he said. That's exactly what there, he said. There, there, there is, that, that is, even though it's instinct, there is brain work going on. It's just at levels that we can't, it's happening so quickly that we can't comprehend it. But for him, while it's happening, he's like achieving this state of grace. So, his, his brain is computing as it's happening. Yeah, just drop my shoulder here to make him think I'm going that way. And then, then I go that way. But from the point of view of, of the defender trying to mark him, off balance, flustered, it's all happening too quickly. So, you know, for, for, for the sportsman in control, and I think boxing shows this wonderfully, wonderfully well. For the sportsman in control, he's seeing things in slow motion. It's one of the reasons Raging Bull is such a great film, because you see lots of things from the point of view of the boxer, Jake LaMotta, in slow motion. From the point of view of who's, who's getting a beating, it's just a flurry, a whirl of, of, of activity, and it's all happened too quickly, and the ball's already in the back of the net. So how, how do we rate this England performance then? And how do we rate the match? Well, I think it's, it, it's, it's a magnificent performance. And it is, as I say, it's, it's the moment where Bobby Robson finds the kind of model of his team. He has his two central midfielders, Ray Wilkins and Brian Robson, performing at the peak of their talents. Um, they were good together in 82 in the World Cup. 86, it went wrong for, for, for both of them. Uh, but here, is, here they are at their absolute peak. Uh, and uh, they've got to be at their absolute peak because they're, they're holding the fort. Uh, against against a team that 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 really wants to over, overwhelm them, so there's a lot of inexperienced players in there. A lot of players winning their first cap or second cap or third cap, a lot of them. But it, it's built around that midfield axis of Robson and Wilkins. 
Peter Shilton, as we say, stands up strong, especially at the start of the game when he has to. Kenny Sanson, who's the, the experienced left back, has it's the highlight of the game, I think, his individual duel against Renato, who gets the better of him once or twice, but uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's a really good duel. So his experienced players stand up strong for him. And that drags the others with him. And you get Haitley and Barnes up front producing these little moments of, of, of magic that, that win the game. So uh, I think it's a, it's a and again, friendlies back then weren't seen as quite as irrelevant as, as they are now. And Robson is almost like his job is on the line because England have failed to qualify for, for, for the Euros and they just lost game after game after game. Had they been humiliated here, there would have been calls for, for his dismissal. And, uh, and so, uh, in all of that context, I think it's, it's, it's one of the great England performances. Front page of The Observer on this day, the 10th of June, 1984, back home, Pope John Paul I was murdered, author says. Do you want to comment on that too? No, because uh, it may not be front page in the papers, but I think at this time, the most significant domestic event in our lifetimes is taking place. And that's, that? that's, that's the minor strike. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, see, I, I think, I, yeah, I think this is, this is, and I got obsessed with the charts as well. Um, I'll get into this in just a minute, but this is the moment where the, everything the Thatcher government has prepared for is happening now. You know, they, 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 had, they, had, they had taken power with the opinion that, the economy that they wanted to produce was incompatible with a strong trade union movement. And the miners were the shock troops. They brought down the Heath government uh, in, in, in the mid seventies and they'd been preparing for, for the, this, this moment. And we know that they won, they won a, they won a crushing victory. And that is the start of zero hour contracts, short term contracts, all of that, all of the stuff which is the bread and butter of the lives of the younger generation, especially these days. Because as a result of them winning the minor strike and the destruction of the, of the trade union movement, really, capital gets to write the laws of the labour market. And that's such a huge, huge change. So you get that. On the other hand, so that the country is becoming much, much more right wing. On the other hand, it's also becoming much more socially liberal at the same time. And there are two aspects to this. One of this we can link to the game, and that's race. When John Barnes scores one goal, creates the other with a, with a magnificent cross, and travelling with the England, the England fans, there's a group of, of National Front far right who are telling the press and the team that the score of that game was actually 1-0 because a goal from a black guy doesn't count. Now, those kind of opinions, they were just starting to become marginalised. We were, we, we were making progress. We haven't made as much as I thought we had. And, and some of these things have come back in the last few years. But anyone with any memories of the football terraces of the 70s and early 80s would know how prevalent that kind of far-right racism was. And it was just beginning to become marginalised. The other thing, which I think is so vital when you, you look at the charts, is the country becoming more socially liberal on the issue of homosexuality. A lot that you've packed in there. Um, I'll be sanguine because, if I may, because um, I, I do remember the miners' strike very well and how it dominated the landscape. Um, and, you know, I was, out, I was at a very radical university, by the way, at this time. So I, I was very politically, um, astute much more so perhaps than i am now but sometimes i would look at these situations and think well first of all you get the governments you vote for and i i get the fact that those votes can be manipulated in so many different ways but those are the rules you know like football you know you stick to the rules even though some of those rules 
are exploited in one way or another. But you know, let's stick to the offside rule, or let's stick to the, you know, uh, the professional foul, or you know, whatever it might be. And also, I, I, I it, not just in politics, but in these sort of situations where somebody wins, I blame the loser more often than I blame the victor. Um, and that, that, that might be a fault in my uh, thinking, but it's like a football match. Yeah, Man City can be you 9 0. The wonderful Man City have beat you 9 0. Yeah, brilliant. They're fantastic. But what on earth were you lot doing? Is what I want to know. And, you know, like with all these politics, you, you look at the opponents and the people who are defeated in an election and say, well, you, you, I'm sorry, mate, but you got yourself to blame. Either you didn't, I became president of my students' union at university. You know, one of the ways, I did become president by a huge majority, so they wouldn't have um, overtaken me in any case. I mean, out of uh, 3,000 students, my first count, on the first count, I got something like 1,800 votes, and the next person after me got like 80 votes, you know. So I, I was well in the lead, I'm not showing off, I'm just uh, explaining because... What I was going to say is one of the things I did that they didn't do, basically you could get a list of all the students' addresses and literally, you know, the ones off campus and literally go to them and canvas. But the others didn't bother about that because they thought, oh, that's just 50 votes, you know, 50 votes or 100 votes or 200 votes, however many, um, you know, that they didn't immediately have access to. And I went to every single one, every single one. You know, I had, I had a motorcycle, rode around the whole of the area, went to all the people in the outlying areas, parts of uh, town that I'd never have been to before. And I saw every single person and I talked to them and we talked by name and everything like that. I, I, I didn't have any political background there. I wasn't a member of any of the big parties, but I, I'm, I'm just saying I put more work into it than other people. So even if you lose, if you put the maximum amount of work into it, you've still got to take some responsibility. Either your strategy was wrong or whatever it was, it was the wrong timing for you, things that were beyond your control, take the blame. Anyway, uh, the minor strike that we mentioned, you don't find any mention of that. And this is a Sunday, the uh, 10th of June, 1984. You don't find any reference. Well, it really hotted up over the summer, didn't it? That's the, right, uh, that's right. I, I, a long, hot believe summer. Believe me, I know. Glorious summer. That, that, that they were living on our campus from mm -hmm. the uh, autumn of that year, 84. I, I can tell you that very, I remember it very distinctly. And I remember them, you know, their loud farts in the, uh, mm. in the student halls as well. And if you were sharing a bedroom with them and uh, one of those big guys let off a I'm not I'm not honestly I'm not I'm not making anything of this and I apologize but this is the experience I had those guys were big guys they drank like 20 pints of uh, beer they were hard guys from the north uh, you know looking to make a sort of political um, you know to get political support on campus and they had to kip at people's tiny little um um student halls and they ate a lot of food <laughs> what can i say <laughs> i'm not i'm not making other anyway on the, i think it's uh page eight or something of the observer that day there's a cartoon which has got some miners flinging some bottles of yorkshire bitter and the caption is uh that's why they call it yorkshire bitter <laughs> uh, or they don't call it yorkshire bitter for nothing but mrs thatcher that you mentioned uh makes it um, already on pages uh, two and three, I think it is, or certainly page three of the paper that day, because she's expecting some dignitaries from overseas. So there's a series of photographs of her looking quite petulantly at her watch, her, her wrist watch, like, you know, where are they? These foreigners, they, you know, they always flipping come to, they, what's the matter? Can't they keep the time or whatever it is that might be going on in some people's minds? Whatever impact that monetarist extravaganza, the economy, uh, sorry, whatever impact that monetarist extravaganza, the economic summit may have on the outside world, it has left large chunks of central London sterile these last few days. 
that police jargon for any security area out of bounds to the general public since the arrival of seven world leaders, their foreign and finance ministers, personal entourages, and the world press. The parks, walks, and streets surrounding Kensington Palace and Lancaster House have been off limits. Any tourist, jogger, cyclist, or local unwise enough to exercise his right of free passage has been met with curt refusal. You can't go in there, Gov. It's all a sterile area. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because this is, just going back, this is what we forget about Britain under Thatcher, right? Mrs. Thatcher was very smart. She was, um, apart from the fact that she got into Oxford, you know, she, she had to be pretty smart and to go and read chemistry in her day. One of the things she did when she came into power was that uh, she decided to increase the pay of the police force. Now, where do you get your support from? Yeah, and particularly when you need to enforce a lot of things and it's very unpopular. So here you see a group of dignitaries coming to London. It's not like that's never happened before and they're shutting down central London. You can't go anywhere. You can't exercise your rights of free passage because there is a group of seven dignitaries in London. Now, I'm not sure you could get away with that now. Maybe well, isn't, it, isn't isn't it funny that those who rail against the states and all they always want minimum state, minimum state, they always rely on the power of repression of the states. And how, how did she how did she win the minor strike by paying the police fabulous fabulous sums of 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 of, of overtime? But while we're on while we're on Thatcher. Fair play to them. If there's one thing that I think they did all right on, well, much better than you'd expect, it was the AIDS issue, which is coming up really big at this point. And they didn't go down the route of gay plague, moral terror. They didn't do it. And you'd have expected them to, but they didn't. They kept it more scientific fact-based not morality based uh, and and certainly if, if, you, if you look at the the charts the issue of homosexuality it just leaps out of you doesn't it? It, it, it this is this is the moment when the country becomes much more socially liberal on this 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 issue Funny, look, I, I never thought of it like that, but I see where you're going with this. You're absolutely right. Certainly, number one, Frankie goes to Hollywood. Now, I'm not sure there was a single person in the country that doesn't know that uh, Holly Johnson is very, 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 very gay. Was at it this Paul, point. Paul Rutherford? It was indeed. It indeed. was an exercise in campness, isn't it? it I, was. I, I, I didn't. I mean, everyone was going around in these Frankie T-shirts, uh, 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 and their big hit had been "Relax," you know. Which no, is two tribes was even yeah. bigger. Was even yeah. bigger. But you're right. But, their first hit was "Relax." And it, it was a hit because it was shocking. That was one of the reasons that you know, Mike Reed, the Radio but 1 DJ, banned. famously banned it. He, oh, well, right. he banned it, did... it personally. Oh, right. Well, you see, he's reading too much into it. Yeah, he Because is. you're right, it is about fellatio. <laughs> There's no other way around mm -hmm. that. But most people aren't thinking of that. It says, relax, don't do it. <laughs> when you want to suck it to it, relax, don't do it. When you want to come. Now, make of that what you will, but we're still Britain. We're innocent. And there's no sex, please. We're British. So we, we and I'm talking about we as teenagers, even then. I mean, there'll be a lot of teenagers who laugh at me because uh, teenagers at the time, because, yeah, there were lots of people that were a lot more streetwise than I was or or biologically wise or whatever it might be. But I just thought, relax, don't do it when you want to suck it to me. Relax, don't do it when you want to come, when you want to come. I don't know if the girl I was dancing with was thinking, does he not know what he's singing? I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure. Mm. But anyway, Frankie goes to Hollywood. You're right in that sense. Number two, wham, wake me up before you go, go. Mm. Did people generally know that George Michael was gay at this point? No, I don't think they did. Uh, not generally. Was... I think people, there were people who knew, if you were gay, you knew. And I yeah. certainly, my best friend at the time, who was Greek Cypriot, he said to me, look, the man's gay, all right? Yeah. <laughs> he, he seemed to know. I don't know how. <laughs> But, uh, but you know that's the point I'm making. You know, most no, people well, he he, he was being very much marketed as a as a as a heterosexual idol, wasn't he? Oh, pretty at, boy, at the time. Yeah. pretty boy that ladies love, and this was a huge hit for him. And he was going, he was referencing back to those Frankie says relax T-shirts, uh, yes. because the image of this was yes. choose life. Choose and they had life. One of those yeah, Catherine everyone Hammett. was going round in those in those those. T I was thankfully no, nor, nor was I. <laughs> I'm just like, everyone you know. apart from you and me. <laughs> yeah, was, thank was, goodness for that. <laughs> you will never find a photograph of me wearing. But Catherine Hammett uh, t-shirts, baggy t-shirts with huge lettering on. Uh, his was choose life, and I, I remember when they came. And this was, I think, the last wham hit i would have thought i remember when him and andrew ridgely and a bunch of other youngsters uh, came on top of the pops and did this tune and they did it live but it was like a video it was kind of like here we're having a party and don't wake me up before you go go and then you realize oh george michael can actually dance you know he can and he looked fabulous he looked really beautiful if you want to you know paint a sort of a, a male mona lisa that was your boy at that time and um, it was it was very um, healthy. What's the word that they use? Um, you know, when when parents think, "Oh, this is clean, good fun." Yeah, sanitized. Yeah, but it was a great song. Wake me up yeah. before you go. Go. It was you know a half decent song. And then there's only when you leave Spandau Ballet. So this is the new Romantics era as well, just bubbling up. I wasn't really keen on that myself. No, really. me neither. It sold very well with MTV in the States, mm, didn't it? This mm. and 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 Duran Duran. Yeah. And again, there's there's a kind of kind of campness. There about is. It. There is. I think partly what sold it in the States, and especially Duran Duran, that there was this. You know, Yanks love British history. And then there was this, like, with the new romantics, you know, it was all kind of like Lord Byron-esque and so on. So it, they referred back, you know, if you look at the clothes they wore, they, they were clothes from like 200 yeah. years ago, yeah. things like that. You know, very, very stylish clothes, modernised, but essentially the sort but of thing... In that, in that tradition, yes. Of course, of course. You know, the sort of thing that you'd have seen all the great sort of poets, the late poets, mm -hmm. as they were known in those days, uh, wearing. So I think that was partly a reference to that. It could be the campness as well. Even Thomas with high energy is at number five. I can do without that, but number four, yes, small yeah, small town that's, boy. Now, well, this is, beat. it's magnificent. And it's a magnificent record, small town boy, Bronski beat. Uh, it, you know, and it, it's all that kind of cold electronic kind of do 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 noises that that you shouldn't like. Yeah. But in this case, you do it because it, it's so profound and it captures what I imagine. I can't speak from experience. The melancholy of growing up as a homosexual and not being understood and needing to, to get away to the big city. Uh, just that, that sense of melancholic rootlessness. I think it's an absolute, I think it's an amazing record. I think it's one that will has has stood the test of time and and will stand the test of time. A lot of the the, the kind of gay club music that is around, there's lot there's lots of it around at this time. Uh, a, is the celebration, uh, and a lot of it is quite lightweight. Even like things like Hazel Dean and so on, you know, it's kind of or, or even like Denise Williams. Let's hear it for the boy. You know, it's you 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 know who it's being aimed at. And it's that that celebratory side. This is something else. This is why you need the celebratory side. You know, this is what you're running away from. And I, I just I think it's 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 an astounding record. And and one, if you put in the context of 1984, of how explicitly homo a homosexual experience this is, but it can also be universalized on anyone who's grown up, even like the, the uh what's the the, the beatles uh couplet you know she's leaving home she's leaving home after living alone for so many years it, it's you know the adolescent experience 
Um, I think it's a magnificent, magnificent record. I was thinking a, 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 a bit about uh, about the, these kind of gay records. And I played in a band at this time. I was just about to, to end it. And uh, a mate, who did the drummer with the band, he was one who took it really seriously. And he was he, he got a job in a recording studio. He was working in... And all of the stuff that they were doing in this recording studio was all like high energy, made for the gay clubs type thing. And a lot of it is just throwaway. There's one record from this time that really stands out for me. I don't know if you know it. Uh, it's by Barbara Mason. It's called Another Man. Now, Barbara Mason is an American R&B singer. Uh, and uh, in the mid 60s, she had a hit with Yes, I'm Ready. And it, it's a beautiful song. And she sounds like she sounds like what she was, I think, like 17 or something like that. And it, it, it's it's a beautiful song of a girl hoping, proclaiming herself ready that the force of love is going to overcome her fear of losing her virginity. It's a great, great record, Yes, I'm Ready. But it's a really sweet young girl's record. And then fast forward nearly 20 years to 84, and you get a very worldly, sophisticated Barbara Mason. Uh, and another man. It's a, it's a wonderful record, but it's all about her finding out that her husband's gay. You know, my man's loving another man. And it's, it's, it's kind of dark, but there's a celebrationary side as well. So that, that, that kind of, the gay scene at that time, it just seems to have been producing so much that then seeps through, seeps through to the mainstream. You're 100% right. The roots to this, I, I would suggest, lies about eight or nine years before. There was a gay scene in my soul boy days of what the late, uh, coming up to the late 70s in any case, <clears throat> 76 around that time. There was a huge gay scene. It always been there. I've always been a bit, you know, unsure about it myself. But I think towards about 75, 76, started going to gay, and these are gay clubs where you had to be about 21 or 59 to get into them, whatever. But they were the hottest clubs in town for the really underground, underground, if mm. you see what I mean. So you had the the Premier League of soul boys going there, if that makes sense. That, you know, you'd see guys, you'd hail them all up because, you know, they had become a clique within a clique, if you like. And, uh, just like surrounded by gay guys and nobody batted an eyelid, honestly. I mean, I, I think there was a little bit of uh, rent boying going on in those days, by the way. Um, I couldn't prove anything, but th that was a sort of uh, sort of general vibe, I think, I'm not sure. Because uh, there are always, a lot of these gay clubs, not all, but the ones that I'm talking about, the ones that Soul Boys used to go to were always in kind of salubrious parts of town, like Kensington, you know, which has mm -hmm. been blocked up, central uh, <laughs> Kensington, for these uh, dignitaries to come to. And um, anyway, but the music started already then, I would say by the mid-70s, even slightly before this, uh, from about 74, 73, you know, um, well, the whole gay scene, let's face it. The whole sort of disco scene is a gay scene sure. from the start. So go back to 72 and you've got it there. But I, I distinctly remember here in the UK, though, just um, um, the, the, the gay clubs. See, not only did they lead the way with the music, they seemed to attract all the best uh, DJs, but also they led the way with the fashions. Mm -hmm. So I remember when there were elephant cords were fashionable, tight, tight. Uh, you know, not baggy trousers, but tight, but elephant cords and thick elephant cords were fashionable. I remember seeing that first of all, Sombreros. Um, Sombreros was this place. Again, that was in Kensington, Kensington High Street, if I remember, or just off Kensington High Street, I can't remember exactly. And, uh, you know, that, that's what the gay guys were. Not just, and this is how, how um, diligent you are or how if you want to look at it a different way how anal you are about um, the whole sort of fashion thing uh, it wasn't just uh, elephant cords it was also elephant cords where the corners of the pockets had a sort of a leather triangle so they were a little bit more upmarket, market so it wouldn't break off and everything so th th that's how much I remember about that scene but looking at these charts what you were saying about uh, small town boy Again, I would say that most of the country didn't know that this was a, a record about 
a gay boy uh, leaving home, etc. In that way, the lyrics are clear, and it's like and the video as well. By the way, yeah, the video yeah, that had yeah. showed that. The but video I don't makes think, it explicit, and it yeah. Yeah, but I don't think it's clear that the boy is gay, you know. And what I think made this record sometimes music is a, a composition of different uh, uh, disciplines and some of those disciplines don't seem important when you've got a great song it doesn't seem important that this guy's got an amazing voice but that was it mate once he starts singing cra you know in his sort of a soprano alto soprano whatever it is uh, you know or mezzo soprano kind of Full voice that he's got. it's a falsetto from a male point of view but i think it's actually might be a mezzo soprano you know you can actually hear um, the pitch of it but uh i don't i don't think that that's why it's difficult to do this song to cover this song how many mm. people have covered this song you know it's difficult because yeah. the song he makes it he actually makes it it's an amazing track as you say you've also got ultra fox in the charts dancing with tears in my eyes i just want to point out a few tracks and holla um, if you want to return to any of these uh, tracks yeah, or otherwise, on. let's hear it for the boy, Denise Williams. That's the kind of track that you were talking about mm -hmm. a moment ago. The most famous of those people that did tunes for the gay scene, perhaps, were the ladies that used to be called Two Tons of Fun, but by then became the Weather Girls with It's Raining Men. Yeah. You couldn't go to a gay disco in 1982 or whenever that track came out without getting its ready men and everybody went absolutely crazy for it and also you know i remember going what would it have been now in the uh early 90s um i was very close to jocelyn brown the soul singer oh but somebody else's guys in the charts of at this course time, i think yeah it's I, a, I, I, i'm favorites. coming to that I, yeah i heard it on the radio less than an hour ago on the radio wow. yeah um just before we came on air and, and um the I, I know her very well. I know Jocelyn very well. I haven't seen her for a number of years. And the last time I saw her on the box, she's like walking the walking stick. I was really upset. She didn't look physically healthy in any case. Uh, but strong woman, strong, oh, really strong woman. I wouldn't cross uh, Jocelyn Brown for anybody. Mm -hmm. I would not cross her. But she'd go to gay clubs. That was her biggest audience. She's at 50, the number 50 in the charts, going down from 42. Uh, but she'd she'd uh, go to these uh, gay clubs. And when she sang Somebody Else's Guy, I suddenly realised in a gay club, of course, it's yeah. just about That's it. That's a it. man with another man. But outside the gay club, I, I thought Somebody Else's Guy was about this you know very um... well, that, that, that's the skill of it isn't it to, to make a message which is both specific and universal if you can do that then then then, then you've got the lot but it wouldn't go down as much in a let's say a gay women's club would it do you know what i mean right, yeah. <laughs> now i'm not saying that gay women can't describe each other as, as guys guy, yeah. but you know it's more likely to go down mm. well it's not quite universal but i get what you're saying there and there's some other interesting uh tracks in the charts as well um mark Harmon's in there but after the you know uh huge success of tainted love uh, his version of that with soft cell uh, Rufus and Shaka Khan with Ain't Nobody at number mm -hmm. 61, going up from 62, going up slowly. Huge, huge hit, time after time, by Cindy Lauper. It's just creeping up the charts at this point. But, you know, I, I don't know about you, but my missus did a Making Love Songs podcast just recently with uh, Time After Time. Just I love the Miles Davis version. It, it, it saved it for me. He's brilliant. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. I, I, I do know, agree with you. Because you, first, you've got to get around her voice, you know. Uh, and Miles but, Davis version did it for me. But, you know, there were things about that song that I didn't know until this Making Love Songs podcast. My missus is pointing out a few things to me. And I hate to admit that, gosh, you know, you just taught me something. You really hate to admit that with your missus, don't you? <laughs> you taught me something. I'll never live that one down. But she she completely changed my perspective on Cindy Lauper's version of the uh -huh. song. And I feel for Cindy Lauper because this was her biggest hit. She was before this on course to be 
Madonna before Madonna. You know, she was there first with girls. Just want yeah. to have no, fun. Don't do it. Don't do I it. knew that was what put you off. I knew <laughs> it, Tim. You didn't have to tell me. I was As... working in a menswear shop at the time and with a radio on. It was just all the time. Please, please take this away. Please. <laughs> The ladies loved it in any case. Um, I, I feel for her because uh, she let uh, Madonna take the career that was meant for her. And then she yeah. ended up doing this ballad, which is not suitable for her voice, but she makes it work, I think. I think it's you know what, what, looking at this chart, what it, it really made me think, and that's the extent to which punk was not a musical genre. It was a no. state of mind. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like the, 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 the big three... The Pistols, The Clash, and The Jam. All of them were, the model was The Who of 1965. All of them. That, that, that's, where, that, that's where they were. That's where they started. But then the game became, no one wants to become The Who of 1970. Now, the horrible lank hair, the horrible clothes, it's just dirty, uh, and rock. So... And that, that, that was, uh, to, to anyone who grew up at this time, following this from the punk thing, the swear word was rock. No one liked rock and no one was allowed to go anywhere near rock. So, you know, the journey that started with these bands, it can go anywhere in different places, but no one is, no one is going to go down the rock route. So, you know, the, 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 the Pistols, obviously, it's only, it's only one year. And then Johnny Lydon, he's experimenting with rhythm, with, with, with Jar Wobble, you know, in, in, in public image. The Clash go off and become as much a, a dance band as, as, a, as, a, as a Who R&B 1965 band. The Jam mutate now into the, into the Style Council. And, and this, is, this is something that was very, very common right at this time. It's people who, are, who have arrived at jazz through punk. It's a, it's a bizarre way of, 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 of following it, but it's kind of how it happened. When the first thing was like two-tone, which was a development out of punk when the specials came out of punk. And uh, Madness, you've got Madness in, 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 in this chart with, with one of their greats, One Better Day, when they've realized they're bored of being a novelty band and they've realized no one does London Melancholia as well as Madness. And this is a fabulous song about, about, about homeless, about hobos wandering, wandering around London. And you look at them thinking, oh, he's had better days, so let's write a song about that, that, that One Better Day. It's one, of the, it's one of their London classics, I think. So you get, you, you get that. And that started taking people into soul and also into jazz. You've got one in, 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 in the charts here towards it. I think it might, I think it might be climbing. Um, everything but the girl, each and every one, which is, it's a gorgeous song. It's, 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 it's a, it's a lovely summer afternoon song. Um, I saw them live not that long afterwards. I was devastated. They didn't, they didn't have the brass section because the brass section makes this song. But everything but the girl and Ben and Tracy would see themselves without any question whatsoever as being punks. They totally identify, they're old punks. That's what they refer to themselves. Uh, and the spirit of what they were doing was the same DIY spirit that was born in, in 77. Um, Working Week are in the charts with Vincent Amos. Another one, that, a, a few of the people in there have reached jazz through punk. And there's one I want to talk to you about because it's hard to, to, to talk about her and, and, and the band in the way that they were seen in, in, in 1984 because of what subsequently happened. And that's Sade. Because Sade and, and, and the band, and Sade was the name of the band originally, not, ju not just her. I think it's been the same people st sticking with her since it started. Because that music lent itself so much to kind of blandness, it's been forgotten how edgy it was when it first came out. She's in the charts. I think it might be a second hit. When am I going to make a living? And it's, all, it's kind of a punk tale of living on the breadline. Um, but even though, like the first big hit she had, Your Love is King, you know, you've got this beautiful, exotic woman singing 
I'm coming up. I'm coming. You know, there was an edge to it. And that, that I think, has, has, has kind of been forgotten. But I, I, even the, because I, I like a lot of the Sade stuff, but even the, the possible blandness of Sade, I see as a musical journey that started with punk. I would never, ever call the jam punk. Let's leave that aside because I don't want to fall out with you. <laughs> uh, let's leave that to one mm -hmm. side. But yeah, punk changed a lot of things. But let's not give it too much credit because the jazz scene was always there. You know, yeah, as you know, it, it, it's always there, but it's people getting into it for the first time, and then suddenly, yeah, yeah. all the, like when all the stuff we were we were talking a, a few weeks ago with uh, to Kevin Day about all the the post punk stuff that he really loves, the kind of angular Joy Division stuff. You got the Gang of Four, which is much more it's kind of ja jagged, angular white funk. Mm. Uh, but this kind of stuff is as much as part of a part for me it's as much as a part of the post-punk movement as as joy division is I, I, I do get what you're saying i just wanted to just put uh, some historical uh, info into the mix which is just that um, as you know uh, the late 70s and early 80s in the uk was dominated by what we call brit funk uh, which comes out of a jazz um, sensibility and most of those brit funksters were jazz players jazz musicians that just wanted to go a bit more commercial you know likes of david grant uh links uh well the person who went on to become incognito i think before that he was light of the world i mean th th these are jazz bands they're not yeah. you know we just call, we call them brit funksters so there was that narrative but even going further back um here in the uk like you know my missus on her first album the likes of cleveland watkiss are on it who's now known mm -hmm. big in russia by the way big in russia now known as being one of you know britain's foremost jazz singers and has been for quite some time as well there was there was that jazz thing going on quite a while and i see it as a different trajectory to the punk thing because none of those guys were into punk none of the ones that i've mentioned came well, through as i said it, it, punk it's, a, it's a state of mind it is much it is. more than a musical genre it, it, it is. I think you're 100% there. And certainly it, it shook the music industry. And after that, um, the gatekeepers lost a lot of their power. Not as much as they've lost now with all yeah, the um, yeah. yeah the online stuff and but the streaming. Th 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 this for me is one of the, is the central contradiction of the UK in, in 84. Politically, it's hurtling towards the right. Socially, it's becoming more, more, more socially liberal, and I think that's, that's all down music. And that's all down to Margaret Thatcher, as you said. Well, I, th I think in part it's down to things that were happening in the seventies pre-Thatcher. I mean, the feminist movement and so on. Homosexuality has been decriminalised only in nineteen sixty-seven. Now, for for a lot of the country at large, the sixties really happened in the seventies. Yeah, and remember with Mrs. Thatcher as well. And you know, I'm, I'm not making any political point, but. In her cabinet, there were several men, gay men, in her cabinet. They weren't as well, open. She, she, she did throw out Norman St. John Stevens because uh, <laughs> I think he was caught once or twice too often <laughs> in uh, compromising situations. <laughs> no comment. Mm -hmm.